Okay. One second here. Okay. It's pretty bad when you, uh, well, let's pray first, then we can talk about how bad stuff is. Because <laughs> that makes it all okay, right? Uh, let's pray. Lord, uh, we thank you for this day, Lord. We just pray that you'll use our time together um, to edify one another, to help us understand some of the things that are going on in uh, a very tumultuous, turbulent world. And I uh, pray that you will help us to uh, take to heart the things we talk about today and to use them to, as a motivator for us to share the gospel and live holy lives. We just pray you'll bless our time together today in Jesus' name, amen. Well, today I'm going to call this uh, Predictions of Convergence. See, I made my split earth a Pac-Man and it's eating up my prophecy update. Uh, it, what I was complaining about before, or sort of starting to complain about, when I was going to talk, when I was starting to talk, was that I typed in, went to the Bible Gateway. If you don't use BibleGateway.com, it's a great place to get a lot of different Bible versions. Some of them are pretty bad, some of them are not too bad. And uh, so I, I wanted to pull a verse up for Zechariah, so I typed in Zach, Z E C H, and it auto corrected it to Zach, Z A C H, and said there's no verse like that, there's no Bible book like that. So it's pretty bad when the Bible Gateway app is auto-correcting you to um, something. And I don't know if you ever noticed this, when you're searching for something on Google, uh, even DuckDuckGo or some of the other search engines, uh, or you're typing something on your phone and you type a theological term, Apple has no clue, absolutely no clue what you're talking about. Have you ever noticed that? It's kind of interesting. Well, um, hang on here. I think I need to do something. Oh, I already put it in. So these are some of the channels that we're on. We do have an app. Uh, we're trying to get this ported over to an audio thing, and then we'll be on Stitcher and Podbean and all those other things when we get all that to work. Um, I do do a weekly, like I did a midweek update this week. I uh, posted that only to YouTube, uh, just because it, it's just, I don't have a lot of time when I'm doing extra midweek updates and that type of thing. So you'll look at YouTube first, but understand on YouTube, there's certain things related to Charlie Vector 019 that we just don't talk about because we want to preserve the YouTube channel and subscribers for, um, the sermons and things that we post. So we want to we want to keep that going. And YouTube, the the censorship is just off the charts. There was a guy, I think he's a Daily Wire. He posted a bunch of videos about what teachers are saying about certain uh, transgender issues. And he called them something that you would call somebody of that of that nature, um, beginning with the word groom. <laughs> uh, and they they gave him a strike for all of his videos on YouTube. He posted what they're saying. It's just that he called them and they said, well, you're targeting them for hate. So people go out and they post stuff that's just absolute lunacy. But then if you comment on it, you're getting targeted for posting hate. So the censorship is there. Um, I got a, we got a warning about a year, over a year ago now, I think. And you can't get rid of the warning. So anytime we make a violation, it's a strike, and we can't do anything on YouTube for a week unless we appeal, and we can appeal on one when. But on the warning, as I recall, I got a warning I played a video of Naomi Wolf, I think. I was doing a thing on, uh, and it was I put it on a private section of YouTube that nobody else could see. They saw that video. It was called Deplatforming Humanity. It was for a talk I did in Alberta a year ago. Yeah, a year ago, April, May of 2021. And so they gave me a strike, and it says misinformation. I said, it's not misinformation. And so they granted my appeal, or they gave us a warning. So I sent it, uh, posted it uh, publicly, an extra copy of it, and they gave me another warning. 
gave us a warning. And that one, I appealed it, and I said, you just granted the appeal. And they said, well, this appeal is denied. So that's uh, YouTube and Google justice, I guess, that you're dealing with. It's just absolutely insane. So we talk about all these different things that are converging. I'll talk a little bit about this morning. You see I have the burning temple there in the one panel. And the reason, this is a very significant time on the Jewish calendar, and we talk about a lot about Israel and the Jewish people because this is the core of the Bible. Most of the Bible is about Israel. And then there's this question about how going forward in the future will the redeemed people of God relate to each other that have come from the church in Israel and they're grafted into the same olive tree. And there's a, there's a debate about how that relationship works, and I think it's a discussion that the church needs to have. But this is a very important item on the uh, time on the Jewish calendar. And I'll explain that in a moment. And if I don't, please somebody, when I talk about Zechariah, and I don't mention it, say, hey, you forgot to mention it, okay? Because uh, it was just something that occurred to me. So there's this acceleration and convergence of all these different things that we see going on. I think as we get closer to the return of the Lord, and I, I use this, I love this 3D score, uh, and I wish somebody would do a 3D score of an orchestration of a very complex piece, just one page, to show how all these different parts together, and it's, it's multi-layered and it's multi-dimensional, and I think that's a great picture of how the prophetic scriptures are. You have a little piece here, a little piece here, and it's like all these different instruments in an orchestra, and when you integrate them together, and believe me, um, in my view, uh, we need a, uh, a, a group <laughs> like Beethoven of Bible prophecy to piece all that stuff together. Uh, and we don't, I don't think we have that yet because we're sort of still in this period of time, and I talk about the acceleration, the convergence, the logistics, and understanding, and I know I get some people say, well, you just stop talking about that, and you talk about it every week, but it's very important because there's a lot of different pieces going on. Some parts of Bible prophecy that we didn't think were important may turn out to be very important. I believe this happened at the first coming of Jesus, that there were certain prophecies that were existent and had existed for hundreds of years, like prophecies in Isaiah. Then when the Lord came, he, uh, the people missed it. And then we get the New Testament, and Matthew says, well, you know, this is the fulfilled, this is that which was prophesied. And I just don't know how many people that were learned Jewish scholars at the time got that scripture, got what Paul wrote, and they said, oh, I never saw that one. And then it gets complicated, too, because there are, there are gaps in the prophecy. So when you look at like Ezekiel 36, 37, 38, 39, you have a prophecy about the restoration of Israel, the dry bones in Ezekiel chapter 37. And it tells you all these things that are going to happen. And then it says, and then they will know that I am the Lord. So, but that, all this stuff takes place over time, and there might even be a gap from where this, the prophecy ends to where you get to that. Jesus sort of established the concept of a gap in prophecy when he was at... Um, the synagogue in Capernaum at the start of his ministry, where in Luke chapter 4, I think it's around 19 and 20, he got up and quoted from Isaiah. And he read part of the scroll, and then he sat down. And it's interesting if you look at the way they have certain portions assigned to certain days, it appears that that Messianic prophet, prophecy was to be read that day, and he just happened to show up at Capernaum, and he read the first part of it, and he stopped right in the middle of it and said, this has been fulfilled today in your hearing. But then there's all this other stuff about the vengeance of our God and that type of thing, and that's waiting for another time. So even in that verse, there was a gap. 
If you understand Ezekiel chapter 36, which talks about the restoration of the land and the people being brought back to the land and the land being restored. And after you're, you'll be brought back, and, and the implication clearly is you're brought back in unbelief because you're brought, after they're brought back, or in the process of being brought back, it says, and then I will give you a new heart. And then you will know. So you see there's, there's a gap there, and there's been a pretty long gap. So as we get closer and closer to the end, these things will become clearer to us. And that is part based on what I, I quote every week, this um, Daniel chapter 12, verse 8. It's also in Daniel 11 that the words are sealed up, closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. So what do we take from that? Well, it's going to get clearer the closer we get to the time of the return of the Lord. But we ought to all strive to be part of the wise. We ought to be studying, as Daniel, early in Daniel 12, it says going back and forth, to and fro, through the book, to understand what's going on, because that's going to be the framework. And as I've been involved in the eschatology prophecy community somewhat over these last couple of decades, it, there's a lot of disagreement. You know, I, I think this week I was listening to someone, uh, a couple a couple different people, so don't try to figure out exactly who it was I was listening to, but, you know, some people say, oh, you know, Isaiah 17 has already been fulfilled. Mark Hitchcock teaches that. And Mark Hitchcock is a good guy. I like Mark Hitchcock, smart guy. But then there are other people who say, no, no, Isaiah 17 is a prophecy. So there, what do you have there? You have a conflict. So some, when there's a conflict like that, somebody's probably wrong. And then some people say, well, Psalm 83, that was fulfilled in 1948, or that was never really a prophecy, that's just an imprecatory psalm. And others say, no, it's a prophecy, and it might be a more intricate prophecy than you even think. That's sort of where I'm at at this point. But then there are people who I consider friends who disagree with that. You know, and you're, you're allowed to disagree with me, be my friend. I respect you being wrong. And, uh, but that, that's the way it is. And so as these things are happening quickly. So I've tried to portray this graphically uh, somewhat. Uh, so we have these seals. And I think, for example, my view of the seven sealed scroll is that you pop the first seal, that's the white horse, and then the scroll opens up, because the scroll's written front and back. So it opens up, and you, there's more to read. There's more information there when it opens up. Then the second one opens, and the scroll opens a little bit more. You understand how that is? It took me a long time to find a graphic that I could steal or borrow from somebody um, to show that. But I think that that's true. And then my view of the seals is that they extend all the way through this last period of time. Now, I don't like the term tribulation period because I think it creates a lot of confusion, and I don't really think it's in Scripture. I know this last three and a half years is called the Great Tribulation, such as there never what time as never was, before nor ever will be. And that's why I reject the thing called preterism, where people, a lot of people say, Oh, Psalms, you know, all that stuff, all of Revelation was fulfilled in 70 AD. And part of that in Revelation is that Satan is bound. Now, you look around in the world today and you ask the question, the obvious question you should ask, is Satan really bound? What was it that, I think it was Chuck Missile, the first one I heard say this was, well, if he's, he's if he's bound, then he's on a pretty long chain. And uh, when I had a paper route as a kid, there was this, I called it the devil dog, that was tied to it. It was like eight chains the guy had this thing. And every now and then this thing would get out. Usually when I was on vacation and somebody else was filling in for my paper route, 
And one kid got his pants all torn up by this. This dog was just vicious. And, um, and I, so I often thought of that, you know, like if the devil's chained up, then that, I want him on like an eight chain thing, not just a real long, loose one. Or you could say is, well, somebody let him go and somebody needs to go get him and chain him back up because the things we're seeing in the world are just incredible. So as we, as we go through these seals, and I think the, the seal opens and then it extends out over time. So in the fourth seal, it says that he's given a power over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword. Now, some people interpret that, and this is where I disagree with them, I think it's incorrect, that that means that one-fourth of the earth will die. So you'll see people make their charts and their calculations, and they'll say in the first half of this last period, a quarter of the world will die. And then in one of the trumpets, a third dies. That means half the people die in this first half. I, I don't agree with that because I think this extends out all the way. They parallel each other. They increase in intensity until the Lord's return. But once they're open, there's no turning back. I was listening to some videos this week. And the people kept saying, if you think 2019 is, they didn't say it quite this way. If you think 2019 is coming back, forget it. If you think 2020 is coming back, forget it. Because there's a convergence. And I'll talk about a few of those things. But this last half, it's called a great tribulation. Jesus talked about it in Matthew chapter 24, around verse 21. He says, after the abomination of desolation, then he says, then shall be great tribulation, such as never was nor ever will be from the beginning of the world till the end. So I take the words of Jesus pretty seriously, and that is a future event. And I can say, I think you've had things much worse happen in the world than the Roman siege of Jerusalem in 70 AD. So if you, if you want to make Jesus untrue, just say, well, everything was fulfilled in 70 AD, and then the world got a lot worse. I just, I just don't accept that. And I also think, by the way, this will get me in trouble with a lot of people, that in, a, in Jeremiah chapter uh, 30, it talks about the time of Jacob's trouble. And there's a parallel there between what Jeremiah says and what Jesus says, because Jer Jeremiah says it will be a time unlike any other. And Jesus says it will be a time like, unlike any other. So if Jesus says it starts after the abomination of desolation, then I think the time of Jacob's trouble is in this last half. So, and, But I will tell you that I'm probably in a very small minority, but you know, mom told me I was right once. and so. <laughs> but then the other thing, too, is so as these, so for example, here's the fourth horse the pale horse, and it, before it opens, you kind of, we're looking back at all these prophecies, there's like a shadow that's cast, a foreshadow of what's coming. And initially, it's going to be, it's going to be kind of blurry, it's not going to be crystal clear. We know it's coming, but we're going to still be, I think, we're kind of in that period now where we're like, is it open? Is it not open? Because it, it just doesn't seem quite like it fits. And then as we get closer to it, the shadow gets like a shadow, gets more clear and more clear until like right before, you're going to say, oh yeah, it's coming. He, the horseman is coming. And that I could do that for all of the seals, for all of the trumpets, and for all of the bowls that there will be a foreshadow before them. So that's just sort of a little bit, um, and that'll apply to all the horsemen. I haven't got my, I'm redoing some of the graphics. I don't have my white horse done yet. Um, Pam won't mow the lawn, so I didn't get my white horse done. And, uh, and then here's the one of the beasts in Revelation. Now, the other thing in this, just sort of give you a framework of how does John Howler think about these things. 
Now, there's a theological term for this, and I'm not going to go into it because I'll pronounce, mispronounce it. But there's a, a theory of seven days from creation. So you see creation to eternity is seven days. Each day represents about a thousand years. So there would be 2,000 from Adam to Abram. And that's about true. Abram, there's disputes on this. So I'm not saying this is crystal clear. And I'm not even saying this is correct. It's just one of the things that I look at, and I'm not date setting. But I do think if you look at this, and this is a, a graphic that I found at a conference that a friend of mine, Reg Kelly, was speaking at recently, uh, a group called uh, mysteryofisrael.com or .org. And they had a conference a couple weeks ago, and one of the guys put up, I thought it was a great graphic. It was like, yeah, that's, what, that's the one I wanted to do. That's the one that was in my mind, but I just couldn't figure out how to get it into a slide. So I, I borrowed it. I'm giving him credit. So two days, 2,000 years from Adam to Abraham. The flood was in there, and then after the flood, Abram came on the scene. And Abram was alive, at least if the biblical chronology and genealogy is correct in terms of years. He was alive when one of Adam's sons was still alive, or Noah's sons was still alive. So he could probably have got pretty good firsthand information about the flood, and he was in Ur of the Chaldees. A lot of people put that in southern Iraq. I actually think it was up in northern Iraq, which means he was even closer to where the ark had come to a rest. And then from Abram, you have the, the, the creation of uh, Israel, the starting of Israel with Abram and his children. And that lasts about 2,000 years until the Lord comes. And then... The question is, okay, so how long has it been since the Lord returned to heaven? And the answer is, we're getting pretty close to about 2,000 years. Now, I don't want to be accused of date setting. I'm just saying, is, I mean, it, we could get to 2040. I don't know if I'll make it to 2040. Um, there's a lot of people not making it right now. Um, had a friend this week who died of a sudden cardiac event in, in Yosemite, uh, 57, and uh, in good shape. I've just seen too much of this, and even insurance executives say that all-cause deaths are up 40% over the last couple of years. Something's going on. That, that I talk about that, but th this is this one that, kind of uncomfortable because it, it hits home and it, like it might affect a lot of people that we know and love it may even affect us so so if you if I get to 2040 and that nothing of this has happened I'll say well probably that wasn't a good way to look at the sweep of human history from a biblical standpoint but if Jesus died and went to heaven around 2029 or uh year 29 to year 32, and then you add in this seven years, and especially the last three and a half years, and you're thinking like, well, if he's going to return, then you're getting kind of close. But it may not be the so I don't want to be accused of date setting. I'm very much, I, I get, believe me, each week my email has a number of emails about somebody, this video, that video, and this and that. And um, so, you know, I look at it and I put it in and I think, okay, if it works out that way, then that guy can say he was right. But if it doesn't work out that way, then uh, sometimes you never hear from the guy again. And that's probably right. But this two-day thing that's based on this passage in Hosea chapter 5, and it says... Uh, starting in uh, chapter 5, verse 15, and it continues on into chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, because there were no chapter breaks back in the old days. I There weren't even punctuation in the original text. 
I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. In their affliction, they will seek me early. So if we understand the scripture correctly, I think this is a very important passage. I learned a lot about this from Arnold Fruchtebaum and Reg Kelly and others that um, this is, they're going, the Lord's going to return because Israel asked him to. There'll be an affliction. Well, that sounds very much like this last period of time that's very intense. And then you layer on top of that the feast days that still need to be fulfilled, and it really starts to, to mesh together very well. And I'll talk more about this. But So it says, Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, and he will heal us. He has smitten, and he binds us up. After two days will he revive us, and the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. So that third day, so after two days, that's when we go into the millennium and then on into eternity. It seems to really fit well together. And when you, when you look at the scripture here about, you know, then it says in Zechariah, then they will look upon him whom they pierced, and they will mourn. That's all tied together with this. I, of this, I have virtually no doubt, the more I study and think about it, and see what's going on. And so, now, see, this is where somebody was supposed to say, hey, you were supposed to say something about mourning, and nobody did. Because I've either put you to sleep, or you for, you've got so enthralled so here's what the, the morning part is. So it says in um, Zechariah that they will look upon him whom they pierced and they will mourn. And this concept of mourning in Jewish history is very important. And in fact, it's either today or tomorrow. I don't think it starts tonight. Tish Bayad. The ninth of Av. It's the on the Jewish calendar is very significant. We know that historically the first temple was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians using the local Edomites mainly on the ninth of Av. We know that the Roman army, garrisons, legion, under the command of Titus Vespasian, destroyed the temple in 70 AD, also on the 9th of Av. And I've been to Rome, and you can go to the Arch of Titus, right there by the Col near the Colosseum, and you can see, you know, they made an arch, a victory arch for Titus when he came back to Rome. And they engraved in stone, and you can still see it to this day, a pictorial story of the ninth of Av in 70 AD, where they destroyed the temple and they carried off the temple treasures. Some people think those treasures are in the Vatican basement, in the Vatican archives. I keep saying that Vatican needs money, they should have a basement sale and bring out the stuff that they have, because I think they have some of it. I don't know how much. But the ninth of Av. In fact, in the when they left Egypt, the tradition is that on the ninth of Av, they found out that because of their unfaithfulness in the wilderness and not following the commands of the Lord and their grousing, that everybody above twenty wasn't going to make it to the holy to the promised land. That happened. They found that out on the ninth of Av. So you see, there's this pattern. So we know there's a pattern of mourning that's coming. And we talk about that in Isaiah. So let's talk about some of the things going on in the world. Um, this is uh, from, and, and I, I, I want to say this, I think, um, I think there's a spiritual 
implication to the physical things we see going on around us. For example, if I look at Europe, I see a very dark place that's dry spiritually. They need the living water in Europe. They need the living water in a lot of ports, parts of the world. And so the drought that we're seeing all over the world is almost, and the famine that's coming or is already here, and we haven't seen it really here in the United States because we grow a lot of our stuff so far. And that's changing, but so here now, they've got this terrible problem. They're not gonna have gas from Russia it, by all estimates, by all indications. Russia's not going to supply gas or much gas to Europe, and they generate a lot of their electricity through gas. So what they're doing is they're, they were decommissioning nuclear power plants in Germany. They, they're stopping that to the extent that they can. They're trying to get one online in France as quickly as they can. They're opening uh, coal-fired plants or stopping the decommissioning of coal-fired plants because, you know, people in the modern day, they just sort of a little bit, they really like their electricity. Um, we kind of like it. I mean, look, what happens when it flicks, uh, flicks on and off at home? But electric's out! Right? Even worse, the internet's down! You know, that type of thing. And uh, at least that's been said at our house. And it takes, you know, it eventually comes back up and everything. But the problem now is that it's been dry in Europe also. And major rivers that are used for transporting coal by barge from coal producing regions in Europe are low and they can't get the barges through. Well, if they don't have coal, then the coal burning plant doesn't work. Coal burning plants need coal to work. And there's so much that moves by barge. It's the cheapest form of, water transportation is the cheapest form of transportation. I was down in uh, uh, Cincinnati with a new friend's house. They live right on the river across from Cincinnati. I mean right on the river. There's a little hill you go down at the end of their driveway. There's a road. And then there's a little bit of ground and a few trees, and there's the river. And we were sitting there on the porch deck talking, these huge barges kept coming by, kept coming by, kept coming by, transporting all of these things. So they're having trouble in Europe. This is a crisis that's happening. I've talked about it many times over the past few weeks that there's Lake Mead is now at one-third of its capacity, lowest level since it was filled. Now there are reservoirs upstream, uh, there's a series of them. Of course, there's Lake Powell, is also on the Colorado River. And then on one of the things that feed into the Colorado River, up in Colorado, there's the Green River. And Pam and I uh, spent some time last year uh, traveling out west, and we were traveling up through um, Colorado from Dillon up towards, we're going up to the Tetons, and we were paralleling the Green River. And I've been there many times, we've been there before. We were there the first time, I think about 23 years, 20, yeah, 23 years ago. And there's this giant lake north of Dillon, Colorado. It was like a giant puddle last year. And that, so that thing is down. And I mean, it is way down. Things, it used to come up, you can see where it used to come up along the road there. It doesn't anymore, and it's a long reservoir. So there's this cascading effect. Um, now, when we were in Vegas a number of years ago, we took an Uber back to the airport, and the guy told us, he goes, you know, I work for a civil engineering firm, and we designed the water main that comes from deep under Lake Mead, and deep in Lake Mead, and feeds like the fountains at the Bellagio Hotel, you know, those magnificent fountains. They have like a, their own special pipeline. And they don't have to pay for it. That was put in like, well, we're gonna build this big hotel, what are you gonna do for us? Well, we'll, get you, we'll guarantee you water. But it's, it's serious. And then the, the flip side of that though is, while we're having drought all these places, this week they closed down Death Valley. 
out in the desert of California because of, because of flooding, flash flooding. People were trapped there. We've had these uh, floods in Kentucky, eastern Kentucky, southern and eastern Kentucky. And they, they got, I think, three times the amount of a normal July rain in like three, two or three days. I mean, it's like a couple feet of rain. I mean, that, that's, it's, it, it's devastating. There's dozens of people have died. So we've had this sort of these extremes everywhere. You, and I saw pictures of flooding in the United Arab Emirates and Iran and other places over the past couple of weeks. So it's just this like, what, it seems like something is going on. But I think that the drought and the famine in some way is indicative of the spiritual drought and the spiritual famine that's going on in the world. It says in Amos that there'll be a famine for the hearing of the word of God. And I think that that's, I think, I don't have any doubt that that's true. So let's look at just a few, like more than a few, as many as we can fit in here. Uh, Kansas had a vote this week. It's primary week. And... Uh, I sort of came to the conclusion this week that there were primary elections, and it seems like the country is still pretty divided on a lot of things. <laughs> and it's about 50-50, if, I, if you're honest about it. So here's Kansas, conservative red state Kansas, although I will add a caveat, they elected that uh, left-wing lunatic Kathleen Sebelius, who served in the Obama administration for a while, I think as Health and Human Services. She's the daughter of an Ohio governor. So they, they, they're not perfect. They elect people they probably would be better off not electing. But they had this referendum on their uh, ballot this week in a primary about abortion. Now, there's a question as to what the referendum was saying. What the left pro-abortion, pro-death people were saying was, look, this is to ban abortion, change the Constitution to ban abortion. And that's not what it said. There was a Kansas Supreme Court case that said, we find the right to abortion in buried in the Constitution, just like the U.S. Supreme Court did in Roe versus Wade, and then followed it up in a whole line of cases, like Casey versus Planned Parenthood, but which Justice Alito, praise the Lord, came out and said, no, 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 this was wrongly decided. And, and you know that it's probably right because of the way people are reacting to it. And Justice Thomas went one step further, and he said, I think we need to review the whole substantive due process thing from which we got legalized sodomy, we got legalized gay marriage, that type of thing, even though people were voting against that. And there's a meltdown on the left. I mean, it's just crazy. So they, so they came out and said, this is to change the Constitution. No, it was just saying the Supreme Court decision in Kansas was wrong. What it meant meant was that the legislature is going to have to decide this. The Supreme Court of Kansas shouldn't decide it. The, the legal reasoning was the same as um, the case, I forget the name of the case, what's the name of the case right now that just um, Dobbs that overturned Roe and Casey. So they lied about what it was, but they convinced enough people, and I was reading the New York Times article and they're saying, Oh, you know, at this conservative Christian church, everybody was really upset that they wanted to enshrine no abortion in the Kansas Constitution, which is not what the referendum said. But all these good church ladies and others were going along with, oh, I don't want my daughter to have to carry a baby to term. And then today, there's a big, big article in the Washington Post about Indiana has really pretty much banned abortion. They passed the law this week. And this is the chamber at the State House in Indianapolis. And of course, the Washington Post is just having a meltdown this morning about this. It just, you want to see 
go watch the Fever Swamp on MSNBC on uh, Morning Joe and Morning Morning Mika. Can you imagine being them married to each other? It's just <laughs> uh, Morning Joe on MSNBC, and they'll be talking about this tomorrow. I sometimes watch it in the morning, and Pam comes out and says, "Shut that off." And uh, I do, you know, put on my headphones. And, uh, but this is happening. Now here's, but there's a lot of attacks going on. I was on David Fiorazzo, Stand Up For The Truth, uh, standupforthetruth.com. You can get that podcast if you want to listen to it. And we didn't even get to this because we had so much to talk about. <laughs> here's a, uh, this is a protest outside um, one of the Catholic churches in Manhattan. These are pro-abortion people. And the cops had to come because they, the people thought they were going to get attacked. Uh, David, on went Thursday on his show, had on Julianne Appling from Wisconsin Right to Life. I don't know the name of the organization. But they've been a firebomb. And there's been about 70 or more clinics around the United States that are pregnancy decision centers where they help people make a decision about abortion. They don't force them to do anything. Regardless of what Liz Warren says, they're not dangerous. But there have been about 70 or 80 of these that have been, that have been firebombed, had rocks thrown through windows and that sort of thing. How, how many of you have heard? I don't think you've heard that much about it. There's been a few. But you're not going to find it in Washington Post and New York Times and everything because they don't, they don't even pretend that it happens. In Congress this week, they had a hearing, and at the hearing, uh, before the hearing, Project Veritas had released a FBI document that was leaked to them about militia violent extremism and all the different flags and things that indicate that people are involved in violent extremism, like they're, they have the Betsy Ross flag. I saw the Betsy Ross flag at Betsy Ross House in Philadelphia, I think or a replica of it, that's violent extremism. And they asked the FBI director, but I said, well, I, I don't know anything about that. They also asked him about the allegations of collusion in the 2016 ele election. And he didn't, he sort of indicated that, yeah, I think there was. Even after all the stuff that's gone on, we're, we're in deep, deep trouble in the United States. And it's probably God's judgment. So here's the Wall Street Journal, the Kansas abortion message. Uh, the defeated amendment wouldn't have imposed abortion restrictions. It would have overruled a 2019 ruling by the state Supreme Court that found a right to abortion in the Kansas Constitution, a case of judicial law writing in our view. Exactly right. Now here's another thing. Is this, the Wall Street Journal did this. Monday they had an editorial op-ed from George Soros, why I support reform prosecutors. Now, do you remember what happened? Oh, it's probably back in the 2020 election. Newt Gingrich was on Fox, uh, Aaron Neville, I think, show. And he said, yeah, Soros is funding, is, you know, funding all of these prosecutors, these radical prosecutors. And they shut him down. And Newt, I, I researched it later, it was, they got, Newt got the information from the New York Times, the Washington Post, and other places, because Soros was bragging about it. Now the, Wash, now the Wall Street Journal editorial page gives him this thing, he says, well, you know, I think it's, we need criminal justice reform. But he's not for reform, he's for tearing down the whole system. That's what we see, right? We've seen, we, we, murder rates are way up. In fact, uh, Senator Cotton, uh, responded to it. Uh, so here's what Soros says. Some pundits, politicians and pundits, have tried to blame recent spikes in crime on the policies of reform-minded prosecutors. The research I've seen says otherwise. I would say, you're 91 or 92. You don't see very well anymore then because there's no research to support it. You are tearing down the system. Soros is one of the most evil men on the planet. That, and that's a fact. And even Cotton comes out and he says, 
Uh, Mr. Soas, prosec uh, prosecutors, uh, practice, prosecutors practice nullification. From New York to Chicago and Los Angeles, they have refused to enforce laws against entire categories of crimes, from shoplifting to disturbing the peace and prostitution. And they do. They do Soros bidding. And therefore, no bail. A guy tries to stab a Republican candidate for governor who's a city congressman in New York, and he's out on bail. I think before the the prosecutor or the, the candidate finished his speech and got lunch, you know, went to dinner. It was attempted murder. They're tearing it down. This is indicative, I think, of a very big indication of the last days. And so murder rates are up in a lot of major cities. The highest city now for uh, murder is New Orleans. They're about two times the murder rate of Chicago. Have a nice dinner when you go. Great food, watch your back, right? So a lot of this is tied to persecution of religious liberty in Rome. Italy, uh, July 20 to 2022 of 2022, there was a conference called the Religious Liberty Summit, and Justice Alito talked about this particular issue, and he should know about pro persecution. And we had death threats against Supreme Court justices that aren't being, nobody's been charged yet, as far as I know. But, you know, Well, I don't have time to go into it. Here's Alito. Here's an example. The European Convention provides that religious liberty is subject to, quote, such limitations as are prescribed by law and are necessary in a democratic society. I'll tell you what, that audio did not turn out. So uh, go to YouTube and you can find Justice Alito's uh, talk. It's very good. Go about 10 minutes in and listen to it. Uh, and he talks about the fact that, you know, I made this decision and then a oh, horror of horrors. I was getting criticized, you know, by European government and even Prince Harry and Meghan Markle were on my case about it. He goes, boy, that really ruined my breakfast. Ha, ha, ha. But uh, his, his point that he made in his speech was that religious liberty is being attacked. Now, there are some, uh, there's a good governor from the uh, free state of Florida, uh, Ron DeSantis, and it was reported this week that he was suspending the state attorney, the prosecutor in Tampa, where I used to be with, has a huge office in Tampa. And I support... Uh, Governor DeSantis, and I think you should listen to what he had to say. This is a Soros-backed prosecutor. He will, you know that he is because he won't answer the question. Did Soros fund you? And he dances around the question. Well, I'm not, is, this, is Soros supporting people? You know, he'll do something like that. Because he's a, he's a leftist. Okay, so here's what DeSantis had to say. The Constitution of Florida has vested the veto power in the governor not in individual state attorneys. And so when you flagrantly violate your oath of office, when you make yourself above the law, uh, you have violated your duty, uh, you have neglected your duty, and you are displaying a lack of competence uh, to be able to reform those duties. And so today, we are suspending state attorney Andrew Warren, effective immediately. That was a bunch of sheriffs there. He went on to say this about some of the things that this guy had done, or not the judicial done. circuit, uh, Andrew Warren has put himself publicly above the law. In June of 2021, he signed a letter saying that he would not enforce any prohibitions on sex change operations for minors. And that's a debate that we're having mostly administratively and through medical licensing in Florida, but other states have enacted penalties on the people that would perform those. 
which are really disfiguring these young kids. And he said, it doesn't matter what the legislature does in the state of Florida. Uh, he's going to exercise a veto over that. In fact, you know, other countries like Sweden, Norway have also put those bans in place. Why? Because there's no science to support it. The FDA has come out and put warnings on this uh, hormone or puberty blocking drug that they're using. It's the drug that they use to chemically castrate people charged of sex crimes put in prison. They're giving it to kids. No long-term studies. I'm sorry. And you have these lunatic doctors, lawyers, like this guy, judges, and teachers pushing it. I don't have time to play it. I'll try to do it next week. The head of the NEA gave a speech in June at the NEA convention and said, we're going to push for the right to abortion. We're going to push the transgender ag agenda. Even though one of the other teacher associates says, well, we're not, we're not doing that. We're not woke. We're not pushing that. They're lying to us. And they're trying to, uh, listen, if you have kids or grandkids, you need to do everything you can, and unless you can assure that this stuff is not in your local school system. And I know it's here in the rural school systems around us. I have teachers tell me that. You've got to get your kids out of school. I know it's hard. I know it's not economically convenient. Here's, what, here's the rest of uh, Governor De, uh, DeSantis's talk. Well, another clip. The Constitution of Florida has vested the veto power in the governor, not in individual state attorneys. And so when you flagrantly violate your oath of office, when you make yourself above the law, uh, you have violated your duty, uh, you have neglected your duty, and you are displaying a lack of competence uh, to be able to reform those duties. And so today... Well, I put it into the same clip twice. But I'm grateful for Governor DeSantis for saying, for doing this in the free state of Florida, what now we can truly call the free state of Florida. Here's a response from this uh, state attorney, Warren. Here's what he says. You may have to pump the sound up on this one. The governor is trying to overthrow the results of a fair and free election. Two of them, actually. And people need to understand. This isn't the governor trying to suspend one elected official. This is the governor trying to overthrow democracy here in Hillsborough County. Okay, so now what, what do you see there? This is where the rule, John's one, one of John's rules of life, like number 8.3, comes into play. If hypocrisy was water, the world would drown. He's the one who's overturning democracy. The people of Florida, through their elect, democratically elected legislatures, have said, we don't want our kids getting this stuff. And you do it, you're, you're a criminal, and you're going to jail. And we're putting in restrictions on abortion, and if you violate it, you're going to jail. That's called the democratically elected law, legislators enacting law. And what does this guy do? He says, I'm not going to follow the law. That's your whole job description. Enforce the law. You have a little bit of, of prosecutorial discretion. I get that. But you can't just wipe out whole categories of it. When 65 people were arrested for a protest for BLM in Tampa a year ago, guess what? No charges. By who? By this guy. So, Governor DeSantis, bravo. Well done. Okay, so here's some more stuff. This startup, this is from the MIT Technology Reveal, this startup wants to copy you into an embryo for organ harvesting. Now, I sort of have a little mixed emotions about this because I'm at the... Uh, sort of the replacement stage on some of my things. They're wearing out. I have worn out. I've had joint replacements. And, uh, of course, I didn't, I, you know, that was metal and titanium and screws and 
nuts and bolts and everything, but um, this is where the technology is going, and this is pretty scary stuff that they're actually creating embryos to grow, and then they'll put them on storage so that when you need the stem cells from your embryo, they'll go get inject you, and then you can grow the organ or repair the organ that you need to be repaired. And see, this is all, and so the whole thing behind this is a theological thing. They want to live forever. And this, this goes like back to Genesis chapter 3. Has God said, if you eat of this, you will surely die? And we see in Scripture, it's appointed unto man once to die, and then the judgment. And they want to reverse all of that. And that Elon Musk is one of the big proponents of stuff like this. So this is uh, very indicative of the world that we live in. Now, uh, there's no sound on this video. But, uh, you know, I talk a lot about the World Economic Forum. And I was going to talk a little bit more about this Future Focus 2025 from the World Economic Forum, Pathways for Progress. What do you think they're trying to push in here? The World Economic Forum, Agenda, the Sustainable Development Goals of the UN, all of these things. But back in December, in fact, you can go back to December 13th, 2020, and I did an update called Tensions. And in that update near the beginning, I talked about this organization that was uh, working with the Vatican, of all people, and it was called the Council for Inclusive Capitalism. So I, I've seen it's being talked about a lot. I, and I'm not saying, well, I did it, you know, I'm so much better. I just happened to see it back in December of 2020. And somebody reminded it of me this morning, and I appreciate that. Because I've been meaning to talk about it, and I just forgot. Making the world fair, more inclusive, and sustainable. Join the global movement with other CEOs, leaders, and individuals transforming our economies and societies. And here's a video that they put up back in 2020. An economic system that is fair, trustworthy, and capable of addressing the most profound challenges facing humanity and our planet is urgently needed. This is Lynn Forrester to the Rothschild, the founder of the Council for Inclusive Capitalism. That spread the benefits of capitalism more equitably and allow individuals to realize their full potential. Aligning our innovation with the UN Sustainable Development Goals and the priorities of inclusive capitalism is both a business and sustainability imperative. We invite all businesses, large and small, and individuals to join us as stewards for inclusive capitalism by going to our website, agreeing the principles, and making your own commitments to inclusive capitalism. Please join us. Thank you. So what, what do you have here is you have, it, it's a movement, and it's, it's not capitalism, it's like, socialistic, fascist Marxism under the guise of inclusive capitalism. So all this stuff I've been talking about, I, you know, I did that thing on Saudi Arabia pushing ESG, Russia funding ESG groups here, BlackRock, you know, the Larry Fink saying, hey, you know, we're, we're, our goal is to change behaviors and we're, for, and we're forcing the change of behaviors in the world. Um, so it's all, it's all tied together. And you saw that the one guy from DuPont was talking about the sustainable development goals. Talked about that a week ago, about the farming thing. The article from Alec New, Alex Newman on the front page of the July 27th Epic Times. It's all about the sustainable development goals. That's why they're restricting nitrogen usage. It's, it's epic. Now, speaking of the Vatican, I should play this. This is, us, uh, and keep the sound down because it's, it's all in Latin or what, Spanish or whatever. But remember back in March, I said that the Pope was going to consecrate 
the world, specifically Ukraine and Russia, to the Sacred Heart of Mary. Well, here's a video of him doing this. Now, I, I've got to tell you, I grew up across the street. There was a Grace Brethren Church where my dad was pastor on one side of the street, and on the other side of the street, next to that church was Little Flower Catholic Church. In fact, some people that used to go there attend here. <laughs> uh, you know them. We've known them for years. They got out of that. But what was going on in that church always kind of, even as a young kid, I think my parents taught me very well, kind of crept me, creeped me out. And this creeps me out. He's talking to a stinking statue. You know what I do? I pray to the living Lord Jesus Christ, who sits at the throne of God and makes intercession for us. Not this garbage. This is satanic. The vision of Fatima was a satanic, demonic vision. Uh, was that clear? <laughs> I'm very passionate about this. Um, I've been in that church. I mean, it's a magnificent edifice. But he's talking to a statue. Just, but it's much better in other parts of Europe. I don't even know what to make of this because I've seen people say some things about this, which I agree with, and then I've read what people say about it, and they say, look Shalom. at what those crazy Christians are talking about. They're just a bunch of conspiracy theorists. Here's a woman riding the beast, Birmingham, England. It was a few miles from there a few years ago to speak. A woman riding the beast at the opening of the Commonwealth Games. And there was Prince Philip and his, whatever they call her, uh, Camilla Parker Bowles. It's actually becoming kind of popular in the UK these days. In comparison to some of the other people in the royal family, it's pretty easy it's a pretty low bar. But look at this. Here's, and they also did this sort of Tower of Babel thing. Here's a video of the... And, and Now, I understand that there's some kind of Brahmi bull or something that's associated with Birmingham. Okay, I get that, okay? But then they got, like, the guy with the trumpets. I, I don't know. I'm not up on Birmingham mythology to know what that's all about. Kind of creepy. So here they are, and then, you know, the tower, this tower thing burns, and they're all running around. They've got these light things that they're holding. It's all very, it's very pagan. And so if you say anything about it, though, people say, oh, you're just, you're, you know, it's just the opening of the games. Look at what they do at the Super Bowl. Look at what they do at the Olympics and all these things. Remember when they opened that Gothard tunnel in Switzerland and the, peg, the goat head pagan thing running around? And here comes the bowl, and you're going to see this lady. She's going to approach it with the light. Well, anyway, you'll see she'll get on. Let me make a comment about something else. So as I'm researching this, I didn't put the clip in. I'll try to play it the next, well, I don't know if I'll play it again because it is one of the creepiest videos I've ever seen. It is a young gal who is sort of new age, mystic. She's got the crystals and all this stuff. And she does yoga. And she's talking about doing this ritual to cleanse the aura of the fetus that she just took a pill and aborted. Did you see this? 
She built an altar to it. Yep. She sacrificed her fetus to this. She's walking around. She has a job. Now listen. Two weeks ago, the New York Times had a thing on cannibalism. On the front, a two-page article on the front page of the Sunday Styles section about how cannibalism is becoming more accepted. And David, for your eyes, I mean, we're kind of scratching our heads because it's like, this is so like foreign to us. And it's like, it's becoming acceptable. And you know what? If you got a gal sitting in her apartment in New York sacrificing and doing an a cleansing of her aborted fetus in some kind of mystical ceremony, I think we're there. You know, the things it talks about in Revelation and Matthew and the prophets is, you know, if the Lord doesn't come back, there would no flesh be saved. That prophecy is really true. I'm concerned about I'm concerned about I live in the world. So I want to I'll have to do another midweek. Iran keeps making I, I have a long clip of Caroline Glick, but it's about eight minutes long and it's I've gone too long already today. Well not quite, but <laughs> I will go way too long if I play it. And so we have this, you know, this video that's done about um, this, you know, turn the sound down on it. The, this Iranian is getting, they're getting closer to having a breakout on a nuclear weapon. And they've said that the, what they're going to do with it. They've said it for years. But our, our administration, well, they're so, much, they're so much smarter than us, they don't believe what the Iranians said. I happen to believe everything they've said. And when they lie, I think I can figure out that they're lying. But you see, one of the judgments of God in the end times is when, when you support all of this stuff, God gives you over to a reprobate mind, and you cannot reason. And we have a whole administration like that right now. And believe me, there's plenty of Republicans that are right there with them. They, you know, we can fight about elections and everything. They need Jesus. But see, the Ayatollah or the people for the Ayatollah, they'll go out and they'll say, oh, you know, you don't need to worry, Israel, because we have a fatwa against the use of nuclear weapons. So Ruthie Bloom, Caroline Glick, others have researched this, and guess what? He's lying. He is a big, fat Muslim liar. I'm sorry. You can, there is no fatwa. They want you to think that there is. That's consistent with some of his doctrine about deception. And he practices it very well. He's got that doctrine down pat. I'm getting worked up up here today. Uh... Oh, I want to mention this. Today, I forgot. I think I skipped over it. So, in the description of this video will be a link to the Israel Defense and Security Forum uh, headed by, uh, I think I could call him my friend now, General Amir Avivi and Moshe Davis, uh, who helps the operations there. And they do a lot of security briefings and that type of thing. And there's one today. You can attend it if you want. It's 3 p.m. It'll probably last about an hour. If you have questions, uh, you can get them to me. I'll get them to, uh, to Moshi beforehand. And um, it'll be about Operation Breaking Dawn. And General Amir Avivi, he's very, he's very well-spoken. He was in the IDF for over 30 years. He was a brigadier general sort of one of the on-the-ground guys in the field. And he really understands what's going on. And one of his things that he's advocating for, which I think is a brilliant idea, is Israel needs a National Guard, like the United States has a National Guard. 
That's one of his things that he's trying to push. But he understands, and I know from talking to him, in listening to his briefings and also talking to him personally, there's a big concern about what's going to happen. So right now there's Operation Breaking Dawn, which is another Gaza, they're firing rockets. I'll talk about it here in just a minute. But what happens when Hezbollah cuts loose? That's, that's still on there, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. So let's look at Breaking Dawn. Um, And then I'll talk about the Lebanon situation, because that's all part of this. So uh, we got a terrorist. That was good. What happened? So the other day, they arrested a PIJ leader. That's the Palestinian Islamic Jihad. And it's a, it's a terror organization. It's not as influential as um, Hamas. But they're vying for control. They're funded directly by Iran. There's just no question about that. So they started firing rockets the other day. And there's been... I have some videos on this. I have a lot more here. <laughs> So here's a little video. Uh, here's here's some of the. Um, you know, that I'll talk about that in a minute. So just remember, Iran Lebanon relations is expected to get stronger. Hmm. Wonder how that works. So here's some of the headlines. <clears throat> These are from some of the newspapers, Arab News, Israel Times, and um, Al Gad newspaper in Jordan, talking about Israel Gaza war. And of course, everybody comes out with the obligatory. You know, Israel's attacking, Israel's killing kids, uh, killing children. I sat at a Christ at the Checkpoint conference next to one of the keynote speakers, and he had had three daughters and a niece killed in a when this rocket exchange took place. And, and I looked him up. I a big article about it in the New York Times back in 2000. Six, seven, eight, nine, something. He was an oncologist, very bright guy, Muslim. And I, I don't doubt his story, but the question was, well, how did they die? Well, Israel killed them. Oh, really? Well, we'll see about that in a minute. So here's a little video on Palestinian Islamic Jihad so you can understand what this organization is about. This is from the IDF. I think there's sound of this. Iran and Gaza. They follow an extreme Islamic ideology. The organization was established as part of a global jihad phenomenon that includes Al-Qaeda and Hezbollah. The ideology of this organization sees terror as the primary tool for the destruction of the state of Israel. The Islamic Jihad in Gaza is a terror organization recognized by the EU, UK, US, Japan, Canada, and Australia. The Islamic Jihad in Gaza is solely a military organization not a governmental movement, and has no intention of leading the Palestinians. Its only purpose is to inflict terror by any means in order to harm Israelis. The organization has carried out over 400 terror attacks and has killed and injured hundreds of Israelis. The Islamic Jihad in Gaza carries out terror attacks against the state of Israel and its citizens on a regular basis and prevents peace and safety in the area. And so they did that. And so what they did was they went and they started rolling the thing up. They took out the leader. They may have arrested the other guy. And they did the old knock on the roof thing that they do. Like, hello, Mr. Palestinian Islamic Jihad leader. Uh, we're going to destroy your apartment in about 30 seconds. You better get to the elevator right now. And in fact, I saw some, I think it was from the, I, yeah, it was from the IDF. They said, listen, we know who all you guys are. We've got your social media. So you have two things. You can run and hide, or you can stay at home and try to delete your social media before we get you. But we are going to get you. This is war. And I mean, 
the IDF and others, people who have succeeded, General Amir Abibi, they're serious about this. This is an existential threat to the nation of Israel. And of course, it's interesting, you look at the editorial cartoons, this is from uh, a Quds newspaper today, and it's all Israel attacking, right? Here's another one. You know, it's all Israel sending stuff in. But those things go both ways. So there's one of that's where the, I think the Palestinian Islamic Jihad guy got, if you want to see that one a little bit better. Here we go. There you go. Pretty, you know, pretty direct, precise, great. Now the next video I'm going to show you. So also in Al-Quds newspaper today on page three, Look at the little girl with the angel wings. Israel's killing children. The king of the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan is accusing Israel of being slaughtering people. I don't know if he used those terms. It's what he meant. Do not trust that guy. I'm telling you. Do not trust that guy. When I've played how many... Dozens of clips have I played of him over the years where he talks about protecting the Christian and Muslim holy sites in Jerusalem. He never mentions the Jewish ones. Even though there's a publication from the WAC, the religious authority there, 1924, I've got, somebody got me a replica copy of it. You've, I've shown it here many times. So this is the location of Solomon's temple. And there's this whole thing that's an industry now to deny the truth. And they're lying. They're just flat out lying. It was never an issue until the Jews came back, like the Bible prophesied. So there were a number of children killed. And so this is, I don't know what happened to this guy I met in 2017 in Oklahoma. His children who were killed in one of these back and forth exchanges. I want you to watch very carefully. Here's an IDF official video of rocket attacks coming from Gaza. I want you to watch what happens. Okay, Operation Breaking Dawn. See the rockets going, going, going. And here comes one in the red circle. And it kind of peters out. And it falls in Gaza. Now, so Israel, Iron Dome, it's expensive, about 50000 per rocket. They've gotten about 95% of these. Most of them, they calculate when they're flying, like, are they going to hit a house? They have all these systems to do that. It's fantastic what they do. But it's expensive. And so some they won't shoot down because they calculate it's going to land in an open field. And then we'll put the fire out if it, the fire is caused. Now, there was one that hit a house in Cedar Oak. Um, family was down in a bomb shelter, so nobody was injured. But everybody's got to go in bomb shelters. There's, they've been in bomb shelters for like three days, and finally Israel said, we, we can't live like this. Here we come. Knock on the roof. We're going to send you a phone call. And then, you know, coming in the window coming through the roof, we're going to get you. But kids were killed by their own rockets. Think about that. And they'll never admit that. They'll blame Israel. Now this next one, this is, this is pretty shocking. Ben Shapiro on his Twitter account, he's in Israel right now, and he went to visit the Temple Mount this morning. And so here, this is a picture from Al-Quds magazine or newspaper. And I know it's kind of hard to watch the violence that you can see going on in this picture. As settlers and Jews storm the Temple Mount. Look at those people back. Look at that little girl. What is she, like nine? That guy, he's got a t-shirt and shorts on. What's he hiding? 
And Ben Shapiro was there, and they accused him of storming the Temple Mount with his children. They were pushing a baby carriage. Oh, the horror. Because the whole thing, there's a good article on Israel, hey, on Israel today. Uh, can't remember the guy's name. You have to translate it. Well, you can find it on the English website. And he said there's this whole thing, this whole industry to change the narrative about the Temple Mount. It's the same thing that goes on here. You know, when Trevor Loudon and others talk about the red, communist Marxist, leftist, green Islamic, red-green axis alliance, they do the same thing. They, they lie. They just flat out lie about things. And so they'll say, storming the Temple Mount. The Jews have no connection to the Temple Mount. Hey, tell you what. You know, go over, let's see, this is... Uh, so the Al-Aqsa Mosque is probably behind them. I think this is the southern end. Anyway, you know, go up, go up to the Dome of the Rock, take a right, go back to that eastern gate room that you're trying to turn into a mosque. There's beams there. Those are from the first and second temple. Go look at the biblical archaeological review. The Jews were there. This is all just a bunch of lies. This is kind of interesting. This is a uh, happened in Mecca. This is the uh, clock tower, King whatever clock tower. It got hit by lightning. It's about the third tallest building on the planet. It has the largest shopping mall in the world there, and one of the largest hotels in the world, overlooking the Grand Mosque of Mecca. So. Uh, so in Israel's Iron Dome, they took out most of the, uh, like I said, 95% of the rockets that were coming. So, I guess you'll just have to watch the uh, midweek update. No, that's Erdogan doing the grain deal. And as a result of the grain deal, there has been grain that's made it out of uh, the ports there. And uh, there we go. So they got this grain deal done. Uh, Port of Odessa, which would be right over in this region. That's where most of the grain, all the grain will come from. And there's grain ship going out through the Bosporus. Now this is kind of an interesting thing. If you want to watch a good video, there's a couple bad words in it though, so I'll warn you about that. Peter Zahn, Z-E-I-H-A-N, about a 16 minute video on the collapse of China. Now, um, I would not, uh, if you're prone to depression and that type of thing, I would not watch it. Uh, I'll give you a warning. Um, you might not want to have any sharp objects around when you watch it. But I, Peter is a, he's a pretty good analyst. analyst. So I, there, and there's a three-minute video that he did the other day about this grain deal to get grain out of Ukraine. And here you see it, and it's got to go down through you know, through Turkey, they're inspected, got to go through the Bosporus, and they go through the Dardanelles, and the Dardanelles at one point are only uh, 2,000 meters, less than 2,000 meters across, less, less, uh, half a mile. And so all this grain has to go through there. So Peter Zahn did a very good job of describing what's going on. And what he said was this, is that... Um, They've gotten, I think, five ships loaded and taking grain. Based on what they can get on one container ship, they need to have to get, there's like 18 million tons of wheat and grain stored in Ukraine, about a little bit over half of their harvest from last year. They're within 45 days of this year harvest. All of their silos are full. So they've gotten 
four or five ships loaded and out this week because they got to be led through this mined harbor and that type of thing and then hope that the Russians don't shoot at them, which could happen. I don't know. Um, hasn't yet. But it's, there, it's a war. They need 700 ships in 45 days. Like 16 ships a day to get the grain there now, let alone what's harvested. And I think what Mr. Peter Zahn says, and I agree with his analysis, is <clears throat> nothing's getting better. Food prices are going to go up. You probably haven't seen it in America because we have, we're kind of different. There's uh, you know, net exporting food countries. We're one of them, Canada. Brazil, Russia, a few others. <clears throat> but then there are a lot of net importing countries where some of them get 85 to 90% of their food imported. In 2009, 2010, when there was a drought in Ukraine and Russia and wheat went down, wheat doubled, and we had the Arab Spring. This is going to be, he says, I think he's correct, beyond the Arab Spring. And this is part of this convergence thing that I talk about all the time today, predictions of convergence. Because there's, there's just a few other things that are going on at the same time. China, in his video, he will say, if people were paying attention, they knew that this thing over Taiwan was going to happen this decade. And I think he's probably uh, correct. It was inevitable. And I don't have the uh, I don't have the slides up. <clears throat> but the other thing he said was is that there are four he looked at four countries. He had the demographic distribution of people for China, Japan, China, EU, United States, and Japan. The four biggest collective economies in the world. <clears throat> he said China is collapsing. They're in major financial collapse right now. We get a lot of things from them. He was talking to a group of of pig farmers. And he said, listen, if you're betting the farm on selling pigs to China, you will lose your farm. Because China is collapsing demographically. And it's worse than their official statistics will let you know. President Xi, I, and I agree with this assessment, so I've, um, President Xi has created the biggest cult of personality around him of maybe any leader in history. If you don't tell him the right thing, you're, you're dead. So what happens? <clears throat> People tell him what they think he wants to hear. China has not prepared itself very well for problems with the Charlie Vector 019er issue. If they did not continue to do lockdowns, they could experience 5 million deaths per month in very short order. Because they, they haven't built up immunity in their population. That's, but do you, understand, do you understand the implications for that? Because they're so big in the global production of things needed for electric cars. This, this fantasy that we're all going to have electric cars. I saw another video this week of a guy, this Tesla ran out of electricity. So the guy came and said, what are you going to do? He said, well, he said, go get me some gas. So the guy came back with the gas. What do you want the gas for? Where are you going to put it? He opened his trunk and he had a generator in there. So I charge it for about 20 minutes and I can get to a charging station. He said, I can get to the gas station. And then you don't need a gas station, you need a charging station. Did you just buy this thing? This world is so insane. 
And now they're doing that green, the, what they're doing in Washington right now is a Green New Deal. And so all the inputs, Peter Zahn talks about this, so what they did in Netherlands on nitrogen, what they're doing in Canada, they're going to do in the United States. The other problem, though, is it may not make any difference because you need natural gas, basically, to produce nitrogen. And so Europe is cutting back on producing nitrogen. And so yields are going to fall. So he said, if, if, this is, if the war in Ukraine stopped today, it's a three-year problem to fix. And that's energy, fertilizer. I mean, it's, it's not the most upbeat thing. But then he said the demographics. And I've talked, I did a talk up at uh, the Go Therefore conference in Lima back in uh, three years ago this month, August of 2019, when we hadn't even heard of this Charlie Vector thing. What is that? And it, we went, if somebody had brought up, talked about it at that conference, people looked at him like, you're, you're crazy, man. Nobody, who's, who ever heard of that? Now we can't get away from it. But I talked about demographics. And Peter Zahn talks about demographics a lot. And he said, listen, China, the problem is not that they're not having children. That problem was 40 years ago. Two or three generations ago, they stopped having children. Now they're running out of adults to work. It's happening in Japan. It's happening in Europe. It changes the capital markets. The United States is kind of getting away with it because we allow a lot of immigration, and we have a pretty large group of the post-millennials. But now the Chinese 10-year census numbers are coming in, and what are they finding? They're only letting it out by drips and drabs. And one of the first things that people are watching and have seen is that China admits, and this person's probably been executed now that told G about this, uh, they overcounted their population by over 100 million people. Almost all of them, women. So, regardless of what people might tell you on ESPN and the NBA network, uh, you need women to have children. And so, he said their problem, he said there is no economic model that shows that a country that gets into this state does anything other than collapse. And so does it happen this year or seven years from now? That's exactly what he said. Is it 2023 or 2030? It's happening. So I'm concerned about the Chinese, the Taiwan thing. I think our speaker, I. Well, you assume that she's thinking, but that, that's a big leap of faith. I don't know why she did it. They're doing it. They've essentially blockaded Taiwan. That's a lot of chip production there. Now, there's a big chip act, chip plant production act that was passed by Congress, a lot of 50 some billion dollars. They're going to build one out here around New Albany. Guess what? <laughs> They're going to be done for a couple of years. Ford and other companies are laying off thousands of people because they don't have the chips for the cars. You buy a car, you get a notice. It's like you can buy the car, but like uh, some of the electronics, it won't work until we get the chips. But you can have the car now. And now BMW says, by the way, you can have heated seats in your car. If you want them to work, because we have a kill switch, we can control them, you can pay us $18 per month to have heated seats. Uh, thanks. I'll just throw a towel in the dryer and throw it on my seat. Don't tell my wife. Yeah, wear a coat. The, uh, it's all insane. And so China's collapsing demographically. We don't know what this looks like because the world has never seen anything like this. And this is what I'm saying. Iran has had the largest decline most steep decline in its fertility rate of any country in human history. 
Ayatollah Khomeini knows that. He's a smart guy. He just knows all the wrong stuff, but he's a smart guy. Xi's a smart guy. They know this is coming. So we look at Bible prophecy, and we see, and you look at your four-day, two-day, one-day thing, and the two days in Hosea, and you wonder, it's like, so these guys, maybe they're going to do something on the way out. And China is now simulating an attack on Taiwan. At the same time, we have fertilizer shortages. We have governments all over the world putting in place fertilizer restrictions. So what was it Jesus said? Because we talk about this all every week, all these things happening, they're converging, they're accelerating, they're, it's like we're living in the middle of a tornado of this stuff, and it's turbulent. I don't like it. But when you see all these things, so the question is, are we seeing all these things? Are we seeing the foreshadows of all of these things? I think we are. And there's a lot of indication that there are countries that want to do bad stuff that are players in Bible prophecy that know that the end is near. They, they're face, they know there's an apocalypse for them. It's, it's the end of time for some countries. But maybe they think they can change it by doing something. And there's a whole list in the Bible that talks about that. So... I'll do a midweek, but I want to talk about something. So this guy, this is Nasrallah from Hezbollah. And there were statistics that were released. There was a Gallup poll that was released, and it said that the angriest country in the well, just take my word for it. You can look up Gallup and angriest country in the world. The, the angriest company, country in the world is Lebanon. Where is Lebanon located? Just north of Israel. Why are they so angry? Well, part of it is guys like Nasrallah who control everything. And look at, look at his office. So over here, he's got the Hezbollah flag and the Iranian flag. Well, that's the Lebanese flag. But I see speeches where he's got the Iranian flag there. But look who's in the picture up here in the left above his head. He's on the left. That's the Ayatollah Khomeini, the leader of Iran. Look over there on the right, across, uh, uh, to the right of, uh, that's the old Ayatollah Khomeini. He's an Iranian stooge, and he's threatening Israel. Why is Lebanon so upset? August 4th, Thursday. August, well, it was, the anniversary was Thursday, two years. The Lebanese, the Beirut port explosion. Here's some video of that. Uh, two to 300 people killed. 300,000 people lost their home. It was the third largest, listen to that, third largest, largest non-nuclear explosion in human history. Caught on video. And this week, the silos that were there, here it is, the world's angriest countries. Lebanon. What it means is, somebody was if you were angry the day before, 49% of Lebanese people were. And they, they don't have power. They get power like maybe two hours a day. Maybe. They don't have food. That explosion destroyed their country's grain supply. It's been sitting there fermenting. It caught on fire. And on uh, Wednesday night, the day before the two-year anniversary of that explosion, about a, I don't know, eighth 
of those silos that have been standing there for two years collapsed. I saw interviews with people a couple weeks ago. You could see the wheat burning in the silo behind them during the interview. It's, uh, that's why they're angry. And I have some stuff <laughs> I'm going to talk about, give you a preview. So there was an article in Al Arabia newspaper on July 8th. It hasn't been discussed that much. There have been a couple of articles at the Times of Israel by someone, and what they're talking about is a Saudi peace plan for Israel, Palestine, Jordan. Now, this is significant in and of itself that it's Saudi. Now, there's been an Arab peace initiative that King Salman and his predecessors pushed, but there's a new king coming. We showed you the new city he wants to build, Neom. Look up what neon means. It's not a good thing, at least if you take some of the English meanings of it. So they proposed a peace plan. It is called the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan Peace Plan. Now, back in 1970, under Yitzhak Rabin, there was a guy named Milan, and he came up with this plan and this is a graphic of it. And go, go to marklangfan.com and you can get it. And I'll, I'm going to talk about this this week because this is important. I mean, this is a big deal, right? I always talk about, is there some kind of peace agreement coming? Is this the covenant of Daniel 9? A lot of argument about it. I don't know. But here's another one. And it's coming from Saudi Arabia. From the new, and, and the guy who wrote the article at Al Arabiya is a, associate mouthpiece for Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. And I talked about this about, I think back in June I started bringing it up because I talked a little bit about this because I had heard some rumors of it coming. So here, but here this is a little, the Alam plan is a little bit different because it has a proposed Palestinian state with a connection between Gaza Strip and, <coughs> and the West Bank, Judea and Samaria. <coughs> and it shows the kind of um, dark orange areas are going to be given to Israel. But that's 1970, okay? And they already gave away all the Gaza Strip. That happened back in 2005 under pressure from Bush 43 uh, when Israel, the prime minister, was Ariel Sharon. How did that go, by the way, the Gaza thing? That was a disaster. By the way, that happened about 48 hours before our southern coast was hit by a hurricane called Katrina. Probably connected. But what they will do is it will be in the Hashemite kingdom of Palestine. So the Hashemite king of Jordan, Abdullah II now, will be the king, and there will be a land bridge there across the Golan Heights. Now, I was looking at this, and as I analyzed it, I thought, it looks a little bit like this Jared Kushner peace plan. And Kushner's out saying all kinds of things in his book right now. And Netanyahu has come out and said, whatever Kushner's saying that I said and what happened is a lie. And I just, there's something that bothers me about this Kushner guy. Always has. And it has nothing to do with his religion or anything like that. It has to do with him. Um, just like Soros. I could care less whether Soros claims to be Jewish. It's irrelevant. It's what he's doing. But so look at, so here's, here's a little, so here's the Alon plan. And then I overlay the, so you see how the, I overlay the Trump plan over top of it. And they look a lot alike, don't they? Without the Jordan thing. The roads, the connections, the tunnel. This thing is a disaster. It, it's a, I don't know, and I saw some people who claim to be good Zionists and everything, and they're saying, oh, this is great, we're going to have peace. Now, we know that in, in uh, Isaiah, 
is it 26, 29? It says this, it's a covenant with death and Sheol. It's not going to be a very good covenant. If that's part of this whole process, I think it is. And this is kind of flying under the radar. Have you heard much about this, by the way? No. So, uh, and it, it would be insane. I mean, if you look at the uh, cross-section of Israel, um, this is sort of a thing that I've used. Um, I got this graphic from a Mormon website. Uh, great graphics, bad theology. Um, it shows the, the lay of the land. And you see Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal there around Shechem, Nablus. Uh, here's a cross-section looking uh, from south to north. So Israel will keep up to the high ridge line, but then this Hashemite kingdom of Jordan would get everything on the other slope down to where 70% of Israel lives, and 80% of their industrial base is located in that coastal strip. This is a big deal, and that's the watershed. Go, go to marklangfan.com. He's a lawyer, and he's done a good analysis on this. He's got some videos up, interviews with Eric Stackelback of The Watchman, and he said that we would give away our watershed. So, this is, uh, so you see Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim there in the central ridge here, the central highlands, the mountains of Israel. This is what the prophecies are about. And they want to give them away. You can see the Mediterranean over there. Um, here's a, I found a 3D graphic. I'm going to finish, I promise I will finish with this. This will kind of give you the idea of how the, from the Dead Sea up to these, this ridge, it's like 4,000, 4,500 feet. It's a perfect defense barrier. You cannot give this away and defend Israel. That's why they need to keep the Jordan Valley. But here's a, a picture of a 3D projection of somebody that did of, uh, of Nablus. You see Nablus here. That's where Jacob's well is. Um, I'll get my laser real quickly. Well, maybe I can, I can draw a little bit. So this is this whole thing is Nablus right here. This is Mount Ebal. It's where they found Joshua's altar. You can go see it. This is Mount Gerizim, where the Samaritan temple was. Shechem is this little... Oh, here, let me go to the next slide. Shechem is this kind of the ancient city of Shechem. You can go there. It's not the safest place to go. It's kind of crazy if you do, but Cam and I did with a friend. And um, one of the most moving moments of my life, friends, I know i got to wrap it up. You stand there and you can see the stone that Joshua erected as a memorial to all the things that happened to the people of Israel. Um. So you can see this, this lay of the land, how it is. We'll, we'll talk more about it. I'll, I'll do a midweek, and we'll talk. about. I just hope you can understand what I'm trying to say here today is that I, we are living in a time where things are converging, a lot of things. How soon this wrap up wraps up, I have no idea. I may not live to see it. I can acknowledge that. But I know something is going on. We need to share the gospel with people. Um, got an email from somebody this week. He said, I shared your prophecy updates with some people here. And three, three of my friends accepted the Lord. I have, I have no idea how that happens, my friends. I really don't. All the, and it has nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with Jesus and the Father, and the Holy Spirit. They're, we just throw out there the best we can do, and God does the rest. So keep watching, and we'll 
be covering these things. Let's pray, Lord. Thank you so much for this day. We pray that you'll help us to keep all of these things to my, in our mind. That at the very unique time that we live it, but we are so blessed to live at that time. Just like people in the first century said they were blessed to live in that day, we should consider ourselves blessed to live in this day so that we can do our part in preparing the world for the return of the Lord. Bless us this week. Give us opportunities to share the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen.